Hello everyone, I'm Daisy Ellis-Vaughan and I'm in the first year of my PhD at Newcastle <coughs> University. I'm uh, doing a partnership PhD, so that means I'm working in collaboration with the Great North Museum in Newcastle. Today I'm going to be talking about my research which involves working with the Greek vases from the Shefton collection in the Great North Museum. And for those of you that haven't visited uh, Newcastle or the museum before, the Shefton collection is a collection of ancient Greek and Etruscan archaeology and it's the legacy of Brian Shefton who was the university professor which collected the artefacts. Um, so as a brief overview, my research involves tracing the histories of the vases to create object biographies of them. For anybody that isn't familiar with the term object biography, it basically just means tracing the biography or the life of an object from the moment that it's created through all of the intervening periods up until the present day. The moment which an object exists outside of its original context its significance changes, and ancient artefacts in particular have whole intervening periods of how they've gone from being used in 5th century Athens, for example, to being on display in a public museum. Yet these intervening periods are rarely acknowledged in museum displays. My main research question is looking at how museums can implement an object biography approach in their displays, so that rather than just displaying Greek vases as ancient Greek vases used in ancient Greece, Museums can instead engage visitors with more of these alternative narratives relating to the different periods of an artefact's existence. To begin with, I'll talk a bit about the Shefton collection as a whole and how it was created, and then I'm going to focus on one particular vase which is on display in the museum as an example of the object biographies which I'm going to be creating. The Shefton collection began its story in 1955 when classical archaeologist Brian Shefton, pictured here, moved to Newcastle to take up a position as a lecturer in ancient history at the university. When he arrived, the vice chancellor of the time encouraged Brian to create a small collection of classical antiquities to support the teaching of Greek archaeology. Starting with a small grant of just £25, Brian began collecting. Since the initial purchase of three Greek vases with that £25, the collection has grown considerably, and upon Brian's retirement in 1984, it consisted of nearly 1,000 Greek and Etruscan artefacts. Brian developed the collection through a combination of university acquisitions and grants from funding bodies, as well as bequests and loans from external benefactors. He became a familiar figure in London sale rooms and auction houses, operating across the worlds of both academia and the art market in a way which future university archaeologists wouldn't be able to do. The collection has been displayed in various locations within the universities until 2009 when it was transferred to its current location in the refurbished Great North Museum. In 2010, to mark Brian's 90th birthday, the Greek gallery was renamed the Shefton Gallery of Greek and Etruscan Archaeology. And you can see uh, the gallery being opened here by Brian and a photograph of its current display on the right hand side. Brian Shefton remained actively involved in the collection right up until he passed away in 2012. For my research, I'm focusing on the Greek painted pottery from the collection, as these are objects which tend to have particularly interesting histories. Because of their decoration, they became very popular to 18th and 19th century collectors, and this means that the past locations of them can often be traced through documentation and sales records from auction houses. In total, there are around 60 Greek vases in the Shefton collection, and the imagery on them ranges from scenes of everyday life to scenes of popular myths and gods and goddesses. And here you can see a selection of the types of scenes which we have in the collection. One of the most unique assets of the Shefton collection is that it has an accompanying archive. Brian Shefton was the type of person who never threw anything out, so the archive is completely intact and contains over 100,000 documents detailing his collecting and research between 1955 and 2012. It contains everything from sales receipts to correspondence relating to the artefact in the collection, so I'll be using the archive as the main tool for researching the more modern periods of the vase's histories. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this particular vase from the collection as an example of an object biography which can be created. Uh, I will look at some of the different narratives which could be told in the museum, particularly thinking about the value of displaying ancient artefacts as having existed in multiple different time periods. And I'll refer to this particular vase as the Blenheim Crater, as it used to be housed in Blenheim Palace. 
The Blenheim crater was created in the 5th century BC in Attica. One side of it shows Dionysus, the god of wine, alongside two Maenads, who were the female followers of Dionysus, and the other side shows two more Maenads alongside a satyr. Craters were used for mixing wine and water at the all-male drinking party called the Symposium, so we can assume that it wasn't created with the intention of being an object on display like it is today, but was instead intended to be a very functional household object. The symposium was a communal social event where adult male citizens dined and drank with one another whilst enjoying entertainment in the form of music, dance and poetry. The vase imagery shows one Maenad holding out a snake and another one holding the front half of a torn deer, and that's on the image on the left there. Whilst worshipping Dionysus, Maenads would take part in a frenzied dance and could perform superhuman feats of strength while possessed by the spirit of the god. This strength is epitomised by their ability to handle wild animals and snakes without harm. The torn deer is symbolic of the climax of Maenadic rituals, where Maenads would tear wild animals apart with their bare hands and eat the raw flesh as an act of communion with Dionysus. On the other side, a satyr is shown playing a lyre, which was a stringed instrument which often provided musical entertainment at the symposium. By showing images of the god of wine alongside the Maenads and the satyrs, the images on the pottery would almost have foreshadowed the drinking and the revelry to come for the male viewers of the pottery. So the pottery images acted as sort of a mythical parallel to the drinking party surroundings. The fact that until relatively recently the vase was intact and in one piece, however, also allows for the possibility that it was never used in Greece, but was instead uh, exported to Etruria, which was a place where Greek pottery was very popular at the time. Most of the fully intact vases which exist today are from Etruscan tombs, but we don't actually have any information on the fine spot of the Blenheim crater itself, so it's impossible to know whether it was used in Greece or in Etruria, or perhaps one and then the other. Moving forward, the earliest traceable location of the vase in the modern context is in the collection of Thomas Hope in the late 18th century. Thomas Hope was born to a wealthy banking family who were lavish collectors and entertainers, so it's no surprise that he himself went on to create a vast collection of antiquities. From 1787 to 1795, Hope went on an extended grand tour of Europe where he collected antiquities, and this is when he most likely acquired the Blenheim Crater. In 1807, Hope published a book called Household Furniture and Interior Decoration, the book recorded the layout of rooms and the furniture at his house in Duchess Street in London, which was the location for displaying his collection of antiquities. This floor plan, which you can see here, um, shows the house, um, and it shows that it had four vase rooms in the bottom left, but it also had a picture gallery, a statue gallery, an Egyptian room, an Indian room, so you can see that it wasn't just Greek vases that Hope was collecting, he was just sort of interested in all antiquities from his travels. And one illustration from Hope's book actually shows the Blenheim crater itself uh, displayed beneath the table, but we're not sure whether it was actually displayed in his house in this way or whether he just chose to um, depict it in the book in that way. If the vase wasn't singled out for display underneath the table, then it was most likely displayed alongside all the other vases like this. Uh, this is one of Hope's drawings of one of the vase rooms in his house. And from the drawings, there's only one vase which is the same shape as the Blenheim crater, which is the one that I've circled, and it has a prominent central position. It's possible that this does represent the Blenheim crater, however, without any uh, decoration on it, we can't know for sure. It might just be another vase that he had of the same shape. After Thomas Hope's death in 1831, the house and collection were left to his eldest son, Henry Thomas Hope. The vase then passed through several generations of the Hope family until it was sold at Christie's Auction House in 1917 to a lady named Miss Deacon. Other than the name of the buyer, we have no further information about the sale or where the vase was located after 1917 until its eventual relocation to Blenheim Palace sometime before 1942, which is when it was catalogued there by Beasley. So how did the Blenheim Crater end up in Newcastle? In the late 1970s, the vase was being sold at Christie's auction house, where it accidentally fell to the ground and smashed into fragments. Christie's then gifted these fragments to Brian Shefton so that he could restore the pot and add it to his collection. So without Brian's unique uh, connections, the university wouldn't have been able to afford something 
of this magnitude. And here you can see an image of the curator gluing it back together. And in the museum today, a lot of people don't even know that the vase was ever broken into fragments. They just assume it was whole because we've got all the pieces and it's been conserved so well. Looking at the Blenheim Crater today, it's placed within the Myths and Mortals display case in the Shefton Gallery alongside a variety of different artefacts which link to this theme. As with most museum displays, the artefacts are displayed exclusively with reference to their ancient context and no acknowledgement is given to any of the other periods in their history, so stories such as the Blenheim Crater being dropped at Christie's auction house aren't being told to the public. Moving forward with my research, I'm going to be building biographies of a selection of the vases using the archive and then doing a small gallery redisplay to incorporate the biographies and see how museum visitors respond to it. By looking at the whole lives of the vases rather than limiting them to just their initial periods of use, I'm hoping to show how revealing alternative narratives of ancient artefacts can add value to museum displays. Thank you.